Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all today uh, to today's lecture by this year's Norman A. Sugarman tax scholar in residence, Patricia Kane. Uh, my name is Jonathan Adler. I direct the Center for Business Law and Regulation. Uh, this annual lecture is one of our programs, although it predates the creation of the center. Uh, the tax scholar in residence program was established by a generous gift by Mr. Sugarman in 1976. Uh, a Cleveland native, Norman Sugarman, earned both his BA and his JD uh, from this university, although I guess I should say his BA was from Western Reserve University's Adelbert College, uh, and he graduated first in his class uh, from the School of Law in 1940 and was elected to Order of the Coif. His distinguished career in tax law uh, spanned both public and private practice. Uh, he was an attorney in the Office of Chief Counsel in the Internal Re Revenue Service. He later became an assistant commissioner in the IRS, I believe the first assistant commissioner as a member of the civil service. After his time with the IRS, he joined the law firm that we now know as Baker Hostetler uh, and was very active in the ABA's uh, section on taxation. Uh, Mr. Sugarman uh, passed away in 1986, but we are pleased to have this program to honor his memory. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you today, this year's Norman Sugarman Scholar in Residence uh, and to add her name to the roster of tax law luminaries that we've had uh, in this program. Patricia Kane is the Inez Maybe Distinguished Professor of Law at Santa Clara Law, where she has taught since 2007. Uh, previously, she has taught at the University of Texas, at Washington University, at the University of Iowa, where she was also interim provost and vice provost, uh, an award-winning teacher and scholar, uh, she's a member of the American Law Institute, uh, is, has too many activities, uh, other activities to list here. Uh, she's a nationally recognized expert not only in tax law, but also on estate planning and sexuality in the law. And I think it's fair to say that she is the nation's foremost expert on the application of tax law to same-sex couples. And as you will hear today, uh, trying to ap apply the Eternal Revenue Code uh, to same-sex couples that are recognized as lawful marriages in some states and not in others, uh, but they're also subject to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, uh, raises uh, some interesting problems, uh, to say the least. Uh, and this is among the things she will be discussing today in her lecture, Taxing Families, the Troubling Disconnect Between State and Federal Law. Now, well, you obviously didn't come to hear me speak. I know very little about tax law, uh, but fortunately, uh, Professor Kane knows quite a bit. So without any further ado, I will turn the, t the podium over to her. Thank you so much. Uh, he may not know much about uh, tax law, but I must say at the faculty workshop yesterday, he asked me some very good questions, so he knows something. Uh, I'm very grateful for this invitation. It's given me the occasion to think more deeply about a number of issues that have consumed me for years, and it's given me the occasion to consider the person you honor in the name of this lecture, Norman Sugarman. Um, I didn't know Norman Sugarman, but of course I knew a lot of people who did, including a number of prior lecturers at this event, uh, I associate him with the world of taxation of nonprofits, so when I got this invitation, uh, I went to my library to look up on my shelf to be sure I still had the book on charitable organizations that uh, he was a major contributor to. Uh, but for this lecture, I decided uh, I should do something more responsible. I actually read some of his work, um, and I happened upon a couple of interesting articles he wrote regarding the ruling process uh, for tax law. Um, that's where you can request guidance from the IRS, which ends up being a major story in the stories I'm going to tell you today about same-sex couples. Uh, so I was happy to make that connection. Uh, and I thank my hosts, uh, Case Western Law School, for incredible kindness they've shown me in inviting me here and engaging with me for the full two days that I've been here. Uh, my primary title is Taxing Families. So you can expect some discussion of families in this talk, but be warned, it's primarily about tax. Tax law and tax policy is guided by many principles. Today, I will discuss two that I think are in conflict. The first guiding principle is horizontal equity. In tax law, we talk about t treating similarly situated taxpayers equally. That's fair. The second guiding principle is that federal tax law respects state property law and state family law. It has to. There's no all-encompassing federal property law nor all-encompassing family law. They have to defer to the states to figure out who owns what and who is related to whom, two very key issues uh, in tax law. 
Uh, and sometimes these principles come into conflict. Uh, federal law is committed to equality, uh, but it's equality applied to people who live in different states who are subject to different rules, hence my subtitle, The Troubling Disconnect Between State and Federal Law. Uh, the disconnect manifests itself in a number of ways, and at the most abstract level, it, it should make us think about questions like this. How can you maintain equality in the face of such state-to-state -state difference? Which differences should count and which not count? Uh, but first, I want to be very specific. I'm going to tell two stories uh, that I think explain how we came to our current situation in which the primary taxpaying unit is the husband and wife, and therefore that is what tax law has decided to compare for purposes of horizontal equity. Uh, stories that result in an equality principle of that sort, but stories that raise marital status above state property law. Once I've told the stories, I think it'll be fair to question whether or not the current consensus, which is spouses are a single economic unit for tax purpose, purposes, continues to make sense in light of societal and legal changes. I will, in fact, of course, challenge this consensus. And when I do, I'll make three different points. As the stories will reveal, our decision to treat married couples as the taxpaying unit came about not as a result of normative policy decision making. Uh, we didn't do something that Canada did back in the 60s when they, uh, they had the Carter Commission consider what the ideal tax law would look like and they went into great length saying that the ideal tax paying unit would be the marital unit. We, ne we never did that in this country. It came about in a different way. Uh, secondly, given concerns about equality, even if marital status or the marital unit is to remain the primary tax paying unit, Shouldn't we include all units that look like a marital unit? Uh, at the very least, uh, this should include same-sex married couples, uh, and I think all couples, same-sex and opposite sex, who are recognized as a unit under state law, and maybe even beyond that, couples who look like the marital unit. And that's where DOMA comes in, of course. The Defense of Marriage Act requires that same-sex couples be treated differently from opposite-sex couples who are married. Uh, differently from frumps. That's what we are now calling them in California. Those are federally recognized opposite sex married persons, the frump problem. <laughs> Given the justification for treating married couples as a single unit, excluding the non-frumps, that's us, uh, is not only unequal, but somewhat irrational. It's irrational because the purpose of the tax rules as applied to a marital unit are to measure their income accurately, understanding that they engage in transactions unlike legal strangers, uh, and perhaps we need to recognize that when we decide what is the best way to measure their income accurately. Um, of course, similar rules ought to apply to same-sex spouses because they too, under state law, are a single unit in many ways, and so to measure their income accurately would, would mean applying the same laws to them. And then my final point is that getting rid of DOMA, which I do think will happen sooner or later, it's just a question of when, not if, getting rid of DOMA won't solve the problem for all the unmarried cohabitants out there who resemble spouses but have no formal status, uh, although in a number of ways some of them do have some formal status, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but even then, we have a lot of households that aren't made up of couples. Uh, they're made up, uh, what's, what's the, the largest growing population of households today? What, what, what household is becoming larger more rapidly than anything else? As it turns out, it's truly the single taxpayer, the single taxpayer living alone. At the same time, there's a huge increase in another type of family, a, a family that a sociologist uh, uh, calls the accordion family. That's kind of the family that ebbs and flows. You know, the, the kids leave home, then they come back because of the bad economic times. Some people call this the problem of the boomerang kids. Um, so we have a lot of households that involve more than one person, and we don't have clear rules about how to treat them if they, too, are sharing economic resources in the same ways that spouses are. Um, well, I think, uh, I think all of these points, the uh, concern about equality, concerns about rationally determining the amount that a tax unit's income really is, and the way that households really exist in the modern world, 
should lead us to a more informed discussion of what the ideal tax unit might be. Now, I don't plan to answer that question definitively by the end of this talk. Uh, it would take a book, and I haven't written it yet. Uh, <laughs> but I will offer some suggestions, and I hope that that'll help us start to think about or rethink this problem of who the unit should be. So the stories I'm going to tell, and apologies to any of the faculty members who have heard some of this before uh, in my talk yesterday. The first story is the story of Seaborn. Uh, this is the story of how we got from individual uh, taxpaying units to joint returns. Uh, in the beginning of the income tax, the modern income tax, 1913, uh, there was no taxation of the unit spouses, there was taxation of, of individuals. So husband would file a separate return, wife would file a separate return. They could aggregate their income. It was possible, but there was only one single rate structure rate schedule, and every return was subject to the same one. So, of course, as a result, if you had lots of, of income to put together on a joint return, you wouldn't do that because we also have progressive rates. So you wouldn't be aggregating one spouse's income on top of the other and pushing it up the rates. Or, or maybe you would. The starting rate in those days was 1%. Sound pretty good? <laughs> Low taxes? Uh, and that's what was taxed, uh, that was the rate that was applied to the first 20,000. And then, wow, it went up to a whopping 2%. <laughs> so someone did this calculation. If you did aggregate income, given all of the very low, one, two, three, I think it might, might have gone up to six or seven at some point, the maximum penalty you would pay by choosing to aggregate would be something like $210. Now that's in those days. I mean, that, that's a lot more money today. But, uh, but that tells us something about how taxpayers might have been thinking in the 1913, 14, 15. Then comes World War I. How do you finance World War I? The rates go up. Now, spouses are not aggregating their income. They're trying to think hard. How can we separate it out? How can we divide it equally between the two of us? Why? So that we can take, in those days, who, who was the income person in most families? The husband. So how can we take the husband's last half of his income and maybe assign it to the wife so we can both start at the low income tax brackets and overall kind of play the, the, the progressive uh, rates and pay lower taxes. And this worked uh, in uh, community property states, right? Because community property states vest ownership of the income the second it's earned into the spouses. Husband owns 50%, wife owns 50%. An automatic splitting for income tax purposes. Or so the spouses argue. <coughs> Originally, Treasury and the Attorney General agreed. Uh, then there was this opinion by Justice Holmes that started talking about uh, maybe you should look to the person who controls the income rather than the person who owns the income. And they thought, hmm, okay, that, that, that's good. So who controls the income? The husband, right? I mean, this is, this is early law. We still have, some states still have the full doctrine of coverture. Uh, so that, you know, the husband, the wife doesn't even exist. She's totally merged into the husband, and he's the only legal actor. This has really created some strange results. There was, a, I discovered a period of time in California, community property state, and a, a wife, a wife's earnings are separate property under California law at that time. Or they could agree, rather they could agree that it would be separate property. So they agree that the wife's earnings are separate property. She owns it. Husband has no interest in it. But they tax the husband because he controlled it. And that went on for a number of years, and finally the Ninth Circuit ruled that if the wife, that ownership was the key. If the wife owned it, the wife got to be taxed on it. Um, so ultimately, the IRS and uh, several taxpayers in the various states agreed to a series of test cases. Um, there were five or six. There wasn't one from every single community property state, eight, eight community property states, but there were several agreed upon test cases. The first one to reach the Supreme Court was Seaborn, Poe versus Seaborn. Seaborn's the name of the taxpayer, so I call it Seaborn. Uh, and Mr. and Mrs. Seaborn lived in the state of Washington. He had high earnings, and she reported 50% of them. Supreme Court agreed. It, she owned it from the get-go. There's no transfer back and forth between the two of them. And so as a result, automatically in the community property states, they are splitting their income in half and paying lower taxes than in any other state uh, across the country. Um, could spouses in non-community property states do this? Um, well, if they can do it by state law, why don't we do it by agreement in New York? Why don't we just agree that 50% of the husband's income will vest in the wife? Uh, as it turns out, the same year that uh, Seaborn was handed down, there's another very famous case, Lucas v. Earl, in which the taxpayers, Mr. and Mrs. Earl, did exactly that. They agreed to split their income. Uh, 
Holmes and another famous uh, opinion talking about fruit and trees as though that was very enlightening to us about, about income tax, uh, suggested that uh, no, you could not assign the fruit to a different tree from the one that he, he focused on earning it, but it really is you can't transfer by gratuitous assignment, by gift, any income once you've already owned it and earned it yourself. Um, so there was necessarily a difference in taxation between community property states and non-community property states. Uh, this led to an interesting period in our history where states like Pennsylvania uh, became community property states for a while. Uh, three months in the case of Pennsylvania, they were, they, they were saved by the 1948 uh, Act by Congress. That's the act that created joint returns. Uh, it created joint returns not because some policy body sat down and decided what the ideal taxpaying unit would be, but solely because of the pressure from the taxpayers in New York who did not want to become a community property state and wanted to be able to split their income. I mean, I'm saying, I'm overstating, it was the taxpayers in states other than New York, but New York was debating it uh, in its, uh, in, in, in its uh, house at the time it was adopted. The joint returns were adopted in 1948. Uh, 1948 also created the 50% marital deduction for gift and estate tax that allowed a, uh, a couple, a husband who owned everything, to split his estate gift tax-free with his wife. The split was already automatic in community property states, so that's why they needed the gift tax, uh, 50%. And so this story ends with congressional action to save the equality principle, the equality principle for all spouses. Spouses with equal incomes will now always be taxed equally because they'll be subject to the same rules and the same rate schedule, no matter which spouse is the owner of the income. In other words, equality, in a sense, trumps ownership as the underlying principle here. Um, again, not because of a long study about the ideal tax unit, but because of political pressure uh, for adopting this particular equality principle. Um, so story one ends with this. Next. I'm going to move forward to a second story uh, that uh, starts 1948 forward. 1948, we've got joint returns, but husband and wife are still individuals. They can sell to each other. They recognize gains and losses. Uh, they can make taxable gifts. They have the 50% marital deduction, but if they transfer more than that, they're going to be making taxable gifts, just like all other individual taxpayers. Um, this situation changed dramatically in 1984 with the passage of Section 1041. That's the provision in the Internal Revenue Code that says all transfers between spouses will be ignored for income tax purposes. No gain, no loss. And it also says transfers incident to a divorce. Ex-spouses, if you're tearing apart the family unit and making transfers, those transfers also will be ignored under the income tax. Uh, and this all started with another famous Supreme Court case. It started with the Davis divorce, the case of U.S. v. Davis, 1962. Uh, this was a 1954 divorce. It happened in Delaware, uh, a common law property state, that gave virtually no rights to the wife in the husband's property. Uh, she had the right to support. She had the right to dower. So when they divorced, they entered into a voluntary property settlement agreement. Uh, a good thing they did, because the law probably wouldn't have given her very much. Um, but to enter into a property settle agree settlement agreement, of course, she releases all of her rights, and he pays her off with appreciated stock, stock that he bought at a low-cost basis and is now worth much more. And the IRS says, that's a sale. Now, a lot of people might assume from the negotiation that you do at divorce that it's certainly not a gift, it really is a negotiated transfer, but I submit it's not quite the same thing as selling stock to an outside third party. Uh, maybe it should have been something in between. Nonetheless, the, the Supreme Court upheld the view of the, of the IRS that any time when you divorce, if you are transferring a, appreciated property in exchange for the release of some right or claim that the other spouse had, here it was just for support and dower, you have a taxable gain. And as I say when I talk about this case, I mean, divorce is bad enough. Adding tax liability on top of it makes it uh, even doubly bad. Um, so the conclusion here is that uh, Section 1041 was enacted to save this, but not until 1984. So there's this period from 1962 to 1984 where Seaborn raises its head again. Community property states with spouses who were divorcing. 
Did they have to recognize gain when they divided their property up? They said, we're not engaging in transfers of property. We're taking property that is jointly owned and simply dividing it, splitting it. If A and B own a joint tenancy together or a tenancy in common and they agree to divide it and give A the front 40 and B the back 40, that's not a taxable transaction. There's no gain or loss recognized on that. It's, uh, the IRS says it's not a realization event. Okay, same thing for community property spouses. The courts agreed, Carrie Ayers and Waltz are the two main cases on this, and they said, so long as you're splitting it substantially equally, we won't tax it. <laughs> Finally, the IRS agreed and issued a ruling. So, again, the common law states are jealous of the community property states in the case of divorce. Uh, so a number of cases come along, and, and this, 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 this idea of dividing up already owned property actually worked in a couple of common law states. Uh, in the 1970s up until the early 1980s, if you think about the history of divorce law, uh, this is when we're beginning to get equitable distribution statutes. Some of them stronger than others, and in some cases there were actually equitable rights found, like in Colorado, uh, that existed in a wife, a non-titled holder to property, that were sufficient to compare them to community property rights and call that property split a non-taxable event. Um, so, uh, Congress finally solved the inequality, the geographical inequality problem again by enacting a statute, 1041, transfers between any spouses, whether in community property states or non-community property states, will not be taxable. In fact, they really become one economic unit again. Some people complain that this is a kind of a tax law return to coverture, where the woman loses her identity in the single unit with the husband. Uh, three years before that, another important thing happened, and that was the 100% marital deduction. Uh, so that you can give anything to your spouse, and it won't be taxed by the income tax, or you can transfer anything, it won't be taxed by the income tax, and it won't be taxed by the gift tax. Uh, and, of course, it won't be taxed by the estate tax as well. So that, that kind of brings the conclusion to recognizing a single individual unit. Um, and again, uh, equality sort of trumps over true ownership of property in order to treat spouses in unequal property states equally. Um, now, this state of affairs has created a couple of problems. The first one I'm sure people have heard about over the years, it's the marriage penalty. Uh, briefly, the setting of rates uh, on combined income and the amalgamation of husband and wife for purposes of setting income limits for things like uh, when does the uh, AMT kick in, uh, the, the alternative minimum tax, uh, how much income do you have to have before you start learning, le losing the ability to fully deduct all of your deductible items. Uh, because of where these things are set, treating husband and wife as one and not treating them as two whole individuals, like as if they were single, creates a marriage tax penalty. Um, uh, you know, now we actually have a different equality principle. That is the equality between how I'm taxed if I'm single and how I'm taxed if I get married. Um, and it's one that has concerned tax law for a while. In fact, a previous lecturer at this event, Boris Bitker, some time ago, back in the 1970s, actually put this uh, forward very clearly. Uh, we appear to have three core tax principles that people are worried about. These are not the ones I stated. One is marriage neutrality. If we had marriage neutrality, we wouldn't have a marriage tax penalty. Another, and this is the result of Seaborn, is that equal taxation of equal income spouses. And the third is progressive tax rates. Now, if you think about that long enough, you'll have to agree with Professor Bitker. There is no way you can have all three of those things. The best you can do is only two out of those three. Um, so what have we adopted? We've adopted progressive rates and equal taxation of equal income spouses, and we've given up on uh, marriage neutrality. Uh, that was caused, really, by the 1948 political resolution of the Seaborn problem. Uh, so I think it's time to question this prioritization, prioritization and, and maybe do it some other way. Many others have thought so, too, over time. Feminists, in particular, uh, have made the claim that we ought to tax individuals as individuals. Um, that, after all, honors the individual autonomy of both spouses in a relationship, and if we're concerned about individual autonomy or one 
one of the spouses kind of getting lost and merged into the other. It's usually the wife uh, that suffers from that. Um, I tend to agree. I, I support individual responsibility to the government, not, rather than my being responsible for my spouse's taxes. I think individual responsibility is good. I think, uh, I, I think um, joint and several liability is what came with the joint return, and that's created some problems. Um, but I think the individual against the narrow unit question becomes more complicated when you think beyond rates, that's just setting of rates, which is where most of the marriage penalty comes from, to the other question, which is how to allocate income and deductions when you're in a marital unit. Um, I was debating whether to put this line in or not. Okay. Um, the Seaborn problem has got to remain because Seaborn is about ownership, and Seaborn says uh, the spouses own it 50 50. That's true for deductions. So if you pay deductions with community income that's owned 50 50, uh, you only get to pay, you only get to claim the deduction you pay. So if you pay 50%, you only get half of it. Uh, some people think the best way to cure this problem uh, is to have Congress. Uh, say, under federal tax law, we will not recognize community property at all. And I think that's one solution. I mean, I think Congress could do that. After all, taxes are not broccoli. They'd have the power. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why I hesitate. Uh, still, in my view, community property has become so entrenched in our way of thinking about taxes and if you think about the community property states, including California, Texas, I mean, these are not small states, and they have a lot of political power, uh, and they really care about their community property laws. So it's very hard to, for me to imagine that Congress would, in fact, actually totally uh, repeal community property. And I'm not sure it'd be a good, a good idea either, because what would the default rules be on ownership? Uh, you're kind of moving into a black hole. Um, so, in response uh, to the marriage tax penalty question, we're left with the problem that a return to the individual tax unit resurrects the geographical inequality from the days of Seaborn. Uh, we get progressive rates and marriage neutrality, but not equal taxation of spousal units. Uh, we do get a return to the principle of ownership, taxation follow following ownership, uh, if you tax by individuals and recognize state property rules. Uh, and then the next problem is the problem of the frumps. Uh, the problem that only federally recognized opposite-sex married persons are recognized under the law. Uh, so this is about DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, a space that I find uh, very uh, prominent in the troubling disconnect between state and federal law. Couldn't be more apparent uh, except when you apply DOMA. Uh, here's a brief report of where we are for those who haven't kept up day by day, which I have to do because I teach this stuff and things do change day by day. Uh, today, we have eight jurisdictions, if you include D.C., that recognize same-sex marriage. Um, that's soon to become ten uh, if the Washington law goes into effect and the Maryland law goes into effect. That would be ten jurisdictions in this country. That's a lot that recognize same-sex marriage when the feds don't. There are ten jurisdictions that recognize what I'll call spousal equivalencies or alternatives. These are the states that have passed statutes recognizing civil unions, and registered domestic part or registered domestic partnerships and basically giving them all the rights and responsibilities that spouses have. Uh, and then there's a handful of states that have recognized that, well, Hawaii has an alternative called reciprocal beneficiaries. They have a civil union statute now, but they have a reciprocal uh, uh, beneficiary statute. Uh, Colorado has a beneficiary statute. These people give, these states give something. Uh, but maybe two or three rights, the right to visit in the hospital, maybe, maybe some probate rights. Uh, some of them actually give uh, a, a few tax rights, like you can tra transfer real estate without paying a tax on it, but those are not spousal equivalencies. Um, after adjusting for all of these states that, uh, uh, so, well, some, some of these states recognize too, you can actually choose to be married or be a domestic partner. Uh, that's true in California, that's true in DC. Uh, in Hawaii, you can choose to be civil union, or you can choose to be that reciprocal beneficiary. I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing. Which relation, how strong is your relationship? Well, let's see, which, which relationship do I want to select? Maybe you'd find out if, if your partner had the right to choose which one, or you had to debate it. 
Um, after making those adjustments, however, you end up with uh, 17, 18 states uh, that recognize actual spousal status or spousal equivalent status. Uh, that means there are a fair number of couples who are recognized as, as spouses, uh, but not at the federal level. So I think DOMA's gonna fall soon. Uh, I, I say this all the time, some people agree with me, some people think I'm nuts to ever think that if this case got to this United States Supreme Court, there'd be any chance, but it'll happen one of these days. Uh, it's been held unconstitutional in the last four cases that have ruled on the merits as to its constitutionality, and it looks likely that those cases might be upheld. Some of the cases are in the First Circuit, uh, some are in the Ninth Circuit, one was a bankruptcy case. Uh, uh, it has not been appealed, and so I'm here to pronounce, in case you did not know, that DOMA is forever unconstitutional, well, across the country, unconstitutional in bankruptcy. In any state, that, this is the proof. North Carolina, which clearly does not recognize same-sex marriage, has allowed a same-sex married couple to file jointly in bankruptcy because DOMA is unconstitutional in bankruptcy. Um, at any rate, I, I, I've, got a, I've got an argument about the constitutionality of, of DOMA, and I, I spent most of the faculty workshop yesterday, so I'm, I'm going to talking about that. So I'm going to try to keep this a little bit on the short side. Um, the primary justifications for DOMA. What are they? Uh, if you read the legislative history, they list four, and I can kind of summarize them into two different types of justifications. One is to protect traditional marriage. Pretty straightforward, protect traditional marriage. And the other is to preserve federal resources. So just briefly, let's uh, test those purposes as applied to federal tax law uh, and see if it makes sense. Uh, so what benefits? do frumps, the opposite sex spouses, what benefits do they get from the tax law? Are we really protecting traditional marriage because we're giving them a bunch of benefits? Um, well, here's one. Uh, the couple with a stay-at-home spouse with no income is going to be allowed to split under the joint return, and they will enjoy a lower tax rate uh, if the marriage is recognized than for those couples, same-sex couples, where it's not. Uh, the only problem with this is that only affects some opposite sex married couples because there's also the marriage tax penalty, which affects a lot. So it's either a benefit or a burden, depending on which opposite sex married couple you are. And recent statistics show that there are more people that get a penalty than there are who get a bonus. Um, so that would seem like it is not uh, there to protect traditional spouses, nor to preserve resources. Uh, there's employer-provided health care that uh, uh, can be provided tax-free, income tax-free to an employee's spouse. That's a clear benefit, uh, and it uh, does not apply to same-sex uh, spouses, uh, but that's one benefit. Uh, filing jointly eases the process of filing, because when you aggregate income and aggregate deductions, you don't have to do that allocation problem I've talked about between the two spouses. Uh, in fact, many of us uh, spend hours uh, not fighting with the IRS, fighting with the, the, the tax return software. Uh, because, you know, you, you kind of think, okay, they, they asked me a question, but I know that this 1099 has my social security number on it and that that's what went to the IRS, so I've got to be very, very careful to report it on the very line that the computer won't spit it out and send me a CP2000 letter and say I owe taxes because I didn't report it. I don't know why it is that every joint bank account and every mortgage can only be reported to the IRS using the first social security number. Now, spouses don't have to worry about that, but everybody in my community has been worrying about this for years. I mean, it's easy to get around, but you have to sometimes outthink the software and put everything in the right place. I made a mistake one year. I, I added up all of our joint bank account interest. You know, it wasn't much, probably, what, $75 between us, uh, but four different accounts. I have a spouse who really likes to keep different accounts. Um, and so one is, in her one is in my name, three are in her name. I added them up. I split them. Got a CP2000 letter because I didn't report it on the right line. I didn't report it on the right line. Um, so that's a problem, and the joint return certainly resolves that problem. Or we could just change the reporting rules, I assume. Um, but this also carries a detriment. I mean, for a joint return, it's easier to file, but you end up with joint and several tax liability, which 
can sometimes be a detriment if you are married to a deadbeat who does not report his income and then the IRS comes after you because you signed the joint return. We have innocent spouse rules, but they're, they're drawn narrowly. They don't cover everyone. Um, and finally, tax law serves to benefit traditional spouses over alternative couples because the tax rules have been hammered out over the years to clarify how spouses should be taxed. Clear tax rules are thus the benefit. But providing no rules, or at best unclear ones, to other couples, is a, that's the cost. And, and, and that's a cost of excluding the non-traditional spouse from the tax statutes that are supposed to apply to spouses. Uh, and that consequence strikes me as a cost imposed on the tax system, not as a benefit to traditional spouses. And then there's the detriment. There's the marriage tax penalty, which is actually f pretty high for some people. It can range as much as 20, 25,000. You pay that mo much more in taxes uh, for the privilege of being recognized as a frump, as opposed to some same-sex spouses who do not. Um, and of course, you can't justify that result. Uh, you can't do justify DOMA because of that, because DOMA was supposed to conserve resources. The Congress Budget of Office actually reported that when it crunched the numbers, if we recognized same-sex spouses at the federal level, it would actually raise revenue. It wouldn't lose revenue. So in my view, DOMA is irrational tax policy. Now grant you, many would say that all tax policy is irrational, and, and I think they have their points, um, and therefore it's not necessarily unconstitutional. But I still believe DOMA is unconstitutional, and fortunately, I'm not alone in this opinion. As I told you, there are four, four cases. Two cases out of a district court in Massachusetts that declared DOMA unconstitutional. Uh, after this decision was handed down, uh, uh, the president and his, his attorney general, Attorney General Holder, uh, issued a memo saying that they believe DOMA is unconstitutional and therefore the Department of Justice is no longer going to defend it in court, they, they'll, they'll represent the government, but they won't make the legal arguments defending DOMA because they think that would be against their beliefs that it's unconstitutional, and they are their, their, their public officers, they're supposed to uphold the Constitution. So if they believe the law is unconstitutional, they should not be arguing that it, uh, it is constitutional. Still, Obama's position has been that this is an issue to be decided by the courts, not by the president and his attorney general, so he's gonna keep pursuing the litigation, but someone has to defend DOMA, and that's where BLAG comes in, the so-called bipartisan uh, legal advisory group out of Congress. They wrote DOMA, we should give them the opportunity to defend it. Uh, and that, uh, Blagg's decision in the bankruptcy case is why DOMA is unconstitutional in bankruptcy courts throughout the, the states. When a central district of California bankruptcy court had 20 judges sign on to a single opinion declaring DOMA unconstitutional, uh, Blagg was asked if it wanted to step in and defend DOMA on appeal and they said no. So the U.S. trustee says, okay, I agree to be bound by this decision of the bankruptcy court uh, nationwide, and therefore DOMA is unconstitutional because I'm not going to appeal this opinion uh, if no one's going to defend uh, DOMA before the appellate court. Uh, the latest case is a case called Galinsky. It's in the Northern District of California. It's a federal employee. She wants to get health benefits for her spouse, just like every other federal employee has. By the way, she works for the Ninth Circuit. The court is now on, the case is now on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, it's on appeal on, on a fast track. Uh, Lambda Legal, the, the, the group of lawyers representing her, uh, want to get to an in-bank hearing before the Ninth Circuit, you know, the enlarged uh, panel rather than just the three-judge panel. Why do they want to do that? Because several decades ago, a three-judge panel ruled that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation was only entitled to low-level scrutiny uh, in terms of constitutionality. Uh, equal protection claims, therefore, are harder to, to make under low-level scrutiny, uh, and they think they've got to get to the in-bank panel of the Ninth Circuit, and it's a panel, it's not the whole court of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, to get them to rule that heightened scrutiny should be given to same-sex couples in this fact situation. Um, I mean, I, I do think under, un, under low-level scrutiny there are the arguments, the irrational arguments I made that DOMA should leave anyway because it doesn't make any sense in the tax world. Okay, 
uh, this brings me to my third point back, uh, what was it, 40 minutes ago when I, when I started this. Uh, getting rid of DOMA will not solve the problem with our tax laws. Uh, well, obviously, not all couples are married. <laughs> Easy enough. And, and we don't know exactly, we've got no guidance for those couples, how to tax them. Uh, unless we, of course, decide normatively that for some reason only the married couple, same-sex married and all married or marital equivalents should be the tax unit and cohabitants should not, uh, I think we have to, to, to look at the question of unmarried cohabitants as well. And, and why should married couples be the aim? Has anybody done that work? Well, I mentioned Canada. Canada actually did a long study uh, and, and, and recommended that it be the spousal unit. Uh, it never became the spousal unit in Canada. The feminists went crazy. Uh, you're not going to impose coverture on us in the tax law. Uh, ind our individual responsibility to our government is a good thing. And the feminists so far have won the day in Canada. So Canada has never uh, taxed, uh, taxed jointly. Uh, the United Kingdom, by contrast, started out with joint returns of spouses. Uh, there again, it was the feminists. Uh, they, they, in the 1980s, uh, uh, started getting uh, pretty ver verbal uh, about lo losing their identity under, under the tax law. So in 1990, the United K Kingdom changed. Uh, in fact, almost all countries in the developed world with modern tax systems tax the individual and not the married couple, as in many other cases we are uh, at the low end of the totem pole. Uh, France, just by contrast, uh, maybe I shouldn't bring up France. People have funny feelings about France. Uh, <laughs> they don't like their French fries. Uh, it has a somewhat different system. It taxes the household using rates that in effect allocate income among the various household members depending on whether they're adults or children. Uh, this really allows a household to aggregate uh, but then it applies rates that reflect a principle of individual taxation based on rates rather than uh, a, a group taxation. Uh, so perhaps that's the direction we should take. Individual taxation rather than expanding group taxation to cover all spouses or quasi-spouses. But, you know, if we return to the initial problem, the problem of geographical inequality, uh, if we tax individual by individual, we're back to seaborn. Uh, and this brings me to my last story. Uh, return of the threat of Seaborn. In 2005, California was the first state to extend full community property rights to registered domestic partners, same-sex registered domestic partners. Uh, that means Seaborn for single taxpayers has returned. Uh, surely, I thought to myself when this occurred, no one at the IRS is really keeping up with state family law, so we ought to warn them. Here's a new issue. It's going to turn out to be complex to administer, I think I'll write a law review article about it. Now I've written five. Uh, I thought as an academic I should actually, it was my civic duty actually, to give them a warning, uh, to get them to think about the consequences of the sea change under state law, and perhaps to get them to rule publicly about what some of the complex issues might be. One issue that really concerned people, when the, when the, the law took effect on January 1, 2005, it converted any property that you had acquired from date of registration, which could be all the way back to 2000, it converted it from separate property to community property. And so, you, it, but you had the option to elect out if you did so within a certain amount of time. And there were a lot of rich taxpayers who had a lot of wealth they had acquired during their relationship who were worried that this retroactive recharacterization of se separate property of my property into mine and hers property was somehow going to be a taxable gift. And if it was, they wanted to elect out so they wouldn't have to worry about it. And I thought that was the strongest reason to try to get the IRS through. I, whatever they ruled, I thought clarity of the law was really important in this case. So I got together with a California tax attorney named Don Reed. He found me through some common friend of, friend, friend of ours who, who knew I was interested in this. Uh, and he had a lot of, he'd, he'd worked at the Treasury, so he had a lot of uh, friends still at the Treasury, so we sent emails to all of them. We wrote an ideal revenue ruling. We wanted it to be published as a public revenue ruling. We never heard back. This is when I, I was thinking about uh, Norman Sugarman and, and, and his article. Uh, in 1950, he said, when tax rates are at high levels, certainty as to future tax effects becomes a must. Well, yeah, usually it's a must. You ought to know what the tax rules are. And later he says there are two reasons for the Internal Revenue Service's maintaining the practice of issuing advance rulings. The first is that this process is an important source of information to the Revenue Service as to the tax thinking of taxpayers and tax practitioners. 
Through such requests for tax rulings, the Revenue Service acquires knowledge of tax thinking and transactions and trends with which its agents may have to cope in the future. I was doing my civic duty. Well, I, I informed them. They just stayed silent. Uh, no response in 2004. So Don, the California tax attorney, he actually had clients who were affected by this. Uh, actually, they were neighbors. They became clients because he wanted to, to, to press on this issue. Uh, one had very high income, including a lot of recent stock bonuses. That's what he was concerned about, the retroactive gift. Uh, and the other one was less. So he said, why don't we go for a private letter ruling? You can't go for a private letter ruling. Hypothetically, you have to really be representing a client you know, and have, have a, real, uh, a real case to put before the IRS. So we did. Again, silence. Actually, they called us and, 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 and suggested a lot of absurd things. Uh, one thing they suggested was that each person would be taxed on the constructive transfer of 50, on his income, and then on the constructive transfer of 50% of that income to the other person. Uh, it ended up with everybody being taxed, every couple being taxed on 150% of the total income. Uh, we said, well, we probably don't want that ruling, but think, of, think about it some more. Uh, their, their decision was not to rule. Uh, but they did issue a chief counsel advisory in 2006 that said, Poe versus Seaborn does not apply to registered domestic partners in California as to their personal services income. Uh, why? Because Poe versus Seaborn has ever only been applied to spouses, period. No further explanation. Now, all of us said uh, Poe versus Seaborn was not about marriage law, it was about property law. And so DOMA, of course, has nothing to do with it, but you have to recognize state property law. Um, we kept trying, once we, told, once we were told that there was a new administration that might feel differently about this. Uh, and so we resubmitted the private letter ruling request in 2010 and got a positive answer. So there is now a CCA out there that makes it clear, and I think this is important for uh, same-sex couples th throughout the country, because uh, same-sex couples and their advisors are always worried that the, tax, uh, the IRS is just going to be awful to them and not recognize anything. But this ruling says Poe versus Seaborn applies to same-sex registered domestic partners. It has nothing to do with DOMA. It's all about property law. So whatever property rights are created under state law for same-sex couples, I think you can be assured the IRS will recognize those. The IRS has since even said, we will recognize certain family relationships of same-sex couples. Not the marriage. We can't, what DOMA says, the federal DOMA, it says, if the word spouse or marriage is in a federal statute, it will not include same-sex spouses. But what if you've got a marriage and one of the partners, the spouses, has a child? What's the relationship between the non-parent, the, the, the spouse of the spouse whose child it is? Well, that's a step-parent relationship. And the IRS agrees. If under state law, and I just told you, there's 17 or 18 states who have these laws. Under state law, if you are recognized as a step-parent, step-child, uh, the IRS will recognize it as well. They are going to recognize what the state property law rights are. They just have to apply DOMA to it, and so they can't recognize the spousal relationship. Um, so in, in this last uh, question, and I'll be brief here, because I don't think you want to know the details of how to report income uh, under the community property rules. Besides, I couldn't tell you. I mean, there's so many unanswered questions, uh, I can't even begin. What I can tell you is that uh, I created a listserv. It includes 125 practitioners on, in California, Washington, and Nevada. Those are the three community property states. And they are going nuts in their second year trying to figure out how to split income and deductions 50-50. The income sometimes is fairly easy, although one question is, if it's the earned income of A and you give half of it to B, now is it still earned income? Uh, what about the earned income tax credit? What about con contributions to, uh, uh, to, to retirement plans based on earnings? Whose earnings does it count as? Uh, that's not clear. Deductions. I'll give, I'll, I'll give you one example on deductions. Uh, suppose uh, one partner or spouse owns the home and is making mortgage and interest deductions, pay, paying those payments. Where are they paying them from? Current salary? Well, that's a community payment. That means the person who owns the house is only paying 50%, so only gets 50% of the deduction. Can the non-owner get 50%? Well, I think so, because I, under most community property laws, if, if you make a mortgage payment, uh, of principle with community property, the community becomes a, a part owner. You have to be an owner of the home in order to, to claim the deductions associated with it. 
Uh, but what if it's an interest only? Uh, what, what if you aren't gaining a community ownership? Now you've got a problem under the way the deduction uh, language is, is structured. Um, so there is, of course, a wonderful old case in that 1930 to 1948 period uh, when spouses had this problem. New husband is paying alimony to his ex-spouse out of community property owned with his current spouse. IRS says, you can only deduct 50%. He says, well, do we just lose the other 50%? Ninth Circuit says, no, your wife, your current wife can now claim the alimony deduction 50% that you're paying to your ex-spouse. And it makes sense. I mean, if you're going to split income, you have to split deductions. Otherwise, you're really not splitting the taxable income. But you've got to do it item by item. So my insight from this is, while I agree with the feminist instinct to treat each taxpayer as an individual, I now see how hard it would be to compute individual taxes under our current system. It was much easier for the Seaborns than it is today. We've got a much more complex system. Um, so I think, it, I, I think it's a problem. Um, and I'm going to give you my final proposal rather than lead up to it, so I'll just throw this out. This, this is a, so, so what would our system look like? Maybe what we could do is have everyone Spouses, same-sex spouses, RDPs, civil unions, long-term cohabitants who actually are recognized with property rights in a number of states, whether they're Marvin payment kinds of rights or the state of Washington where they're, they're given quasi-community property rights, really vested rights. Maybe we should have all of those couples file a joint return. Now, that avoids the problem of allocation. Just aggregate income and deductions if one, sp one spouse or partner is entitled to it. Put it on the return. Uh, then the tax return will compute. You'll get a, you'll get a figure. I want to simplify the ta whole tax code while I'm doing this, of course. Uh, you get down to a, a figure that is taxable income. Then you split it. Default rule would be 50-50. In community property states, it would have to be 50-50 unless you've elected out or have a bunch of separate property. And each individual spouse would then file her or his individual tax return and be individually responsible to the government for payment of taxes. Uh, it looks a little bit like a partnership return with K-1s, but I'm not going to import all the partnership tax rules. I would never do that. <laughs> uh, I want to simplify it, get to a bottom line figure of taxable income, and split it out and have two individual turns. Now, there are several things this accomplishes. Taxation according to some degree of ownership, ownership, quasi-ownership, uh, ease of reporting, uh, no real ability each year. I'm not going to do special allocations like you do in partnership. So you, you can't really shift income or deductions where they're more advantageous. Uh, individual responsibility to the government, which is something I want rather than joint and several. Uh, and the tax return would reflect the couple's understanding of ownership. It has to be real. I do want substantial economic effect even if I'm not going to let you do special allocations. So the tax return has to reflect the couple's understanding of ownership. And that means if they get divorced, it would be primary authority of how they own all property. If they've been split in 50-50, even if they're unmarried cohabitants, that means that's their contract. That's their Marvin agreement, 50-50. So it really would have an effect. It would be real. That's how it lines up with the ownership principle. And finally, we'd have some marriage neutrality. Um, if this sort of reporting system became a reality, uh, then I think we return to the ownership principle of Seaborn. But I will admit we will have weakened the strict anti-assignment of income principle embodied in Lucas v. Earle, because we're going to honor the enforceability of these agreements as reflected on the tax return. And that might transfer the ownership principle into something more akin to a taxation according to who benefits from the income. Uh, we might actually also begin to look a little bit like the French system. Uh, all of this makes sense to me. I, I think this, this, this will work, uh, especially when you look at current demographics. Fewer than 50% of American households consist of married couples today. That's down from 78% in the days when the joint return was adopted. Add to that the households that are made up of committed couples, same sex and opposite sex, and you really only get up to 51%. The point I made earlier, 28% of households now consist of a single taxpayer living alone. And I'm not talking about people who are in nursing homes. This is truly households living alone. And a lot of them are young people because they're not getting married as earlier. Um, and of course, the single people don't have to worry about allocations. But then that leaves 
at least one-fifth of the households in this country uh, that are things like accordion families. They change over time, but they really do share resources and expenses while they're living together. So my thought is when the facts in society change, when state laws change as dramatically as they have around who constitutes a family, I think it's time for tax law to take note and make some adjustments. I hope I've challenged you to think about this in a new way, and I thank you for coming today. Can I try a question? We have time for maybe one or two questions if folks would like before, uh, before we go to our reception. If there are any questions, folks could come up to the microphone. Uh, so questions or solutions. <laughs> Thank you very much. The question I have doesn't deal so much with the substance as it does the procedure by which 20 judges in California signed an opinion that pushed back. Do you know about the history of that initiative and have you seen that uh, strategy employed? It, no, you know, it's very, very unusual. I mean, I talked to the lawyer. I know the lawyer who was the bankruptcy lawyer in the case. Um, the Central District of California is the busiest bankruptcy court in the country, so they have a lot of cases before them, and I'm guessing, and he's guessing, they have a lot of same-sex couples that want to file jointly. So it was an issue of interest to a number of the other bankruptcy judges, but I don't know the actual process whereby they, you know, did the chief judge go out and say, anybody want to sign on? I don't know. <laughs> the, the, the interesting story there, of course, is also that the, the U.S. trustee did file did file a notice of, uh, 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 to appeal, to appeal, because he just did it automatically. Then Blagg said no, and so he wanted to, to get permission to unfile, <laughs> and the debtor said no. They wanted to go to the Ninth Circuit directly and get some precedent. That's how we ended up with the agreement by the U.S. trustee saying it's uh, unconstitutional throughout bankruptcy land. Yeah, sure. We have a reception. It's literally on the other side of this wall. So you walk out either side, uh, you can join us there. We have a, a slight token of our appreciation, uh, Tricia, for, for coming and giving us this lecture. But please join me again in thanking her for a very provocative uh, talk.